I'll start by welcoming everybody. It, I have two o'clock on my clock, so we're going to go ahead and get going because we know uh, people have very busy lives. Uh, I am super thrilled to have uh, be able to introduce uh, the second webinar in the Universal Design for Learning series, Nine and Nine. Uh, it's really exciting. This is sponsored by Goodwin University Institute for Learning Innovation and the Goodwin Center for Teaching Excellence and the University of Bridgeport Center for Teaching Excellence in uh, Learning. And today we have with us, if I can go ahead and move my slides, um, uh, our session is focused on UDL uh, representation, specifically language and symbols. And for those of you that uh, are aware, each session um, focuses on one of the UDL guidelines. And what's really exciting, if you don't know it, um, CAST is now uh, providing updates on UDL framework uh, 3.0. And so it's very, very exciting as we move through uh, the next few months. So today we have with us uh, Beth Fornoff and Brian Massio. Brian, I should have asked you how to pronounce your name. Um, and I'm gonna just read your bi their bios to you very quickly, and then we'll move over to having them start their presentation. So as some of you may know, Beth Fornoff is a research scientist at CAS, so we're extremely privileged to have have her here today. Her research explores how educators, including teacher candidates, can draw on disability studies, disability, critical race studies, and universal design for learning as complementary frameworks for inclusive, equity-oriented pedagogy. Brian is an adjunct lecturer at Harvard Graduate School of Education and a guest faculty for the Power of Place Learning Community, which Brian, I had to look that up, so that was exciting for me. Um, he has a background as a K-12 educator and teacher educator. He works as an education consultant with teachers and schools who wish to use universal design for learning in conjunction with other equity-oriented frameworks to best support students and families that have been disserviced through traditional schooling. And just a quick few words, which I've already put some information in the chat. This is being recorded. We will upload the uh, video to YouTube. We also will have it available for you on Padlet. We ask that you keep your mics muted and use the chat. We have a couple of people watching the chat and we'll do our best to draw attention to specific questions to our presenters. And also, the, I guess the final, not I guess, the final thing I want to say, which is really just important to all of us at Goodwin, Goodwin in 2016 adopted universal design for learning as its pedagogy. Within our institution, we are going to start our seventh cohort of faculty training in universal design for learning. This is long-term job embedded training. We also work closely with the University of Bridgeport. They're going to start cohort three. And we are busy with three external universities, Johnson and Wales Universe, uh, University, Mars Hills University, and Hartford Community College in Maryland, um, providing them with long-term training on the application of universal design for learning in higher ed. So this is part and parcel of who we are. We're very mission-driven, and we're just so excited to be able to provide these webinars free of charge to everybody. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn off my mic and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Diana. We really appreciate being here uh, and to be part of this fantastic webinar series. Uh, and we really appreciate all of the folks who are joining us here today. Um, I, as mentioned, we are gonna be focusing on, my, my name is Brian Massio, uh, and we are going to be focusing on the second guideline, which is providing options for language and symbols. And as our title suggests, this is going to be really focused a lot on interrogating the mindset behind the strategies associated with this. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. All right. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Pornoff. Um, I'm studying instead of a research scientist at CAST. Um, before we actually jump right in, we're just going to uh, share a little bit of information with you about today's presentation um, and just give you some information about opportunities for your engagement. Um, so first, um, as Diana said, the chat is active. Um, please feel free to throw questions in the chat. Um, since Brian and I are co-presenting, we'll also help facilitate answering questions in the chat, particularly clarifying questions. We'll try to answer on the spot as we can. Uh, for more in-depth questions, we'll kind of break answers to those into chunks throughout the presentation. So if we don't get to your question right away, um, it just means it's probably a more in-depth question that we might want to spend some more time on later. Um, and if we have time at the end, we're going to hopefully get to some Q&A. Um, we've also embedded opportunities for your engagement. So we're going to be using Mentimeter as a tool to engage everyone in this conversation around guideline two. Um, and then finally, in terms of resources, we have some links over on the right side of your screen. Um, so if you'd like to follow along with our slides, please feel free to use the tiny URL that's there, um, or you can use the QR code. Um, we also have a digital handout that we welcome you to explore. So um, Brian's just going to uh, pull that up for us. So if you want to click on that tiny URL, um, we created this just because uh, we we found out that as we were designing this presentation, our ideas were expanding rather than contracting, but we were very aware of the time limitations and um, wanted to provide some resources for you all that you can explore later. Um, so if you look through this handout, there's resources specific to the guideline, some that we'll actually address and reference and share with you during this presentation, and then just some related literature, including some of our writing um, and some resources from CAST on accessibility and the UDL guidelines. Um, right, if you just scroll down for um, just a tiny bit where it says our writing, um, I did just want to highlight those first two bullets. Um, so Brian and I recently co-edited um, a special issue of Multiple Voices Journal. Um, it's a journal on disability, race, and language intersections in special education. It just dropped yesterday. We are super excited um, about some of the content that's in there and some of the amazing authors that we worked with. Brian, do you mind zooming in on that? Just thank you. <laughs> Awesome. So um, it's those first two bullets in service of equity. Um, so there is, the, it's not an open access journal, um, but we can help um, support access. It's, it should be accessible through many institutions. If not, please feel free to email us. Um, the second bullet is supplemental content related to the journal. So some awesome um, multimodal ways for you to engage with the content. There's podcasts, there's student perspectives, there's narratives from the editors in there as well. That is open access. So we hope you'll uh, take the opportunity to explore that and share with your colleagues. And then our general UDL and accessibility resources are at the bottom. So we hope you'll explore the AIM and site centers as well. Great. So um, we are going to, uh, we want to start by kind of taking a temperature of folks background knowledge about this particular UDL guideline. As Beth mentioned, we're going to be using Mentimeter and there's several ways folks can get to this and utilize this survey. One would be uh, if you have our slides open already, this is hyperlink, you can go there. If you want to use a mobile device of some sort, either a phone or a tablet, and frankly, that might be one of the easier ways, you can use the QR code and go ahead and uh, use that and get right onto that survey. And the survey will advance as we're using it. Um, lastly, and I'm going to navigate now directly to Mentimeter, uh, you can see here another way is to go to menti.com and use this code that's at the top right here. So what we'd like for folks to do is we're asking this question, select the figure that best represents your knowledge of UDL guideline two. And as you can see, there, this figure has three stick figures. To the left is a stick figure with a big question mark. In the middle is a stick figure uh, desperately crawling on the ground. And to the right is a stick figure holding a trophy. So we'll give folks a few moments to be able to go ahead and click on on your screen, whether you're using another tab on your computer or whether you're using a tablet or other mobile device um, on it. You should be able to click on where you best represents uh, your knowledge of UDL guideline too. And so you can see as this is going on in, in live action uh, that it's starting to populate with where folks are clicking on. You start to get this real visual representation of it. 
No, I'm going to give another moment uh, to allow folks to do that. And if you're taking a moment to be able to get on the Mentimeter or this just isn't something that you want to participate in, that's quite fine. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. We'll have lots of opportunities to be able to interact with Mentimeter as we go. Um, so on our next slide... Actually, I can see I can see uh, dots popping up as I'm saying that. So I'll, I'll pause another moment, give folks enough of a chance. Oh, we got some thumbs up. People are liking the Mentimeter. That's great. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. So on this next slide, we're asking a related question: How would you describe your knowledge of UDL guideline two? Now, here you have a space which will allow up to 25 characters for you to type in a word or words that best describes your knowledge of UDL guideline two. And as you can see right now in live action, uh, it's creating a word cloud for us to be able to see. Well, we can see on here lots of emerging, ignorant, beginner, basic, unfamiliar, in process, operational. Emerging, that's great. Beginner is still our largest. I love that we have the uh, broad smile, uh, the, the uh, toothy grin uh, smiley face on there as well. Basic is starting to emerge as one of the larger words too, along with in process. Beginner is still our largest. I love that we also have here lifelong learner, disciplinary, very novice, operational, progressing great uh since it seems to be uh pausing for the moment we'll go ahead and we're going to move on to a third slide this will be our last for the moment but we are going to be coming back to mentimeter again so lastly we now have a slide scale of what's your knowledge of udl guideline two and you can see all the way to the left is i don't know anything about it and all the way to the right is i could be teaching this so on your screen, you can slide uh, that along to match where you are. And we get this visual representation of, uh, as people are selecting, as well as we have it set up to show us what the running average is as we go. For those of you new to Mentimeter, one of the things I'm using right now to determine when to move forward is in the bottom right-hand corner, it shows how many people have interacted on this slide. And uh, while I can see we have 82 participants in the Zoom, we've been kind of uh, pausing at least as we get into our mid to upper 40s on Mentimeter. So once we hit around that is when I've been moving forward. So we had some movement, and right now uh, what we're looking at is really there's some folks have selected all over the sliding scale, and if I cursor over it, um, it shows us how many. So we have nine people who have put it all the way down to the left-hand side. I don't know anything about it. Ten have put just above that. Sixteen people have it right in the middle. Five a little bit further to the right, and three have put in that they could be teaching this, which is great. Um, and I see uh, some folks in the chat helping others out about how to get on to Mentimeter. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, so we have an average of 2.6 right now, which is just a little under midway on here. Great. We're going to set this aside. If either on your phone, tablet, or tab on your computer, if you leave Mentimeter up, um, we will be coming back to it afterwards, and it will just simply progress to the next slide when we do that. But I'm going to bring us back to our slides. Uh, and so now that we have this sense of what people's background information is, we're going to move on. Right. Uh, so we're going to take some time to talk through, now that we're kind of warmed up, we're going to talk a little bit through guideline two and just give a brief overview of what it means and um, what it might mean in terms of design. So on this slide on the left, we have an image of the entire UDL guidelines graphic organizer, including all of the guidelines, um, which are organized by those three principles of multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, 
and multiple means of action and expression. And then we have an arrow pointing toward a zoomed in image of guideline two and its checkpoints. So guideline two falls under the UDL principle of multiple means of representation. And it really emphasizes providing options for language and symbols. Um, now this image that we have on the screen now shows the guideline with some checkpoints underneath. Um, we're not going to go through checkpoint by checkpoint here. As Diana mentioned at the beginning, um, the guidelines are currently undergoing an update. So for those of you who've been working with UDL for a while and who are familiar with the, the guidelines, the graphic organizer, which is just a tool for, for UDL implementation, it's not anything you have to follow exactly or stick to. Um, but, but this is a tool that's constantly updated. So the first iteration um, came out in 2008, and there have been several updates since then. So version 3.0 um, will maintain the spirit. And so guideline two in spirit will remain very much the same with, with overall aims. Um, but the checkpoints might shift around a little bit. So we're going to just highlight some of the key elements and takeaways. Um, so this guideline reminds us that inequalities can arise when information is presented to all learners through a single form of representation, um, through just text, through just video, video for just audio, right? Um, so because UDL is based on this premise that learner variability is to be expected, right? It's an expectation. Um, there will always be variability among our students. Um, we're going to explore that in a lot more depth in the next section of this talk. But this is really a reminder that one size fits all approaches where we do the same thing for everyone, it's inherently inequitable. Um, our learners are bringing a wealth of background knowledge, of resources to our educational spaces, um, which is awesome because it allows us to have a really diverse and unique community of thought. Um, but we also, given that diversity of thought, we need to be really mindful about what expectations we as educators and instructors might have around uh, background knowledge um, and what expectations we might have around what we think students ought to know. So um, we have to, we want to be planning for this variability, right? Um, we want to think about um, how we might pre-teach some concepts that we want to make sure students understand or vocabulary that students might need to build on um, and to make some explicit connections between learners' backgrounds, building on their expertise, their language, their culture, and making resources available to them to fill in any gaps that might exist. We also want to be thinking about ways um, to embed accessibility best practices um, to really continue to push against that one size fits all mentality. So thinking about how can we be intentional about offering content in multiple modalities so that learners can not only access content in multiple representations, but navigate it. Um, so once we've developed resources from our learners, um, making sure that they're accessible, easily usable. So using things like alt text to describe images, using headings within documents to organize text, um, all of that is gonna support navigation and readability. Um, it's helpful for screen readers. And in the digital handout, we've shared resources and links for how to do this. We're not gonna go step-by-step -step in the tutorial now, but you do have all the tools you need um, to start accessing some of those tools. And then another key takeaway from this guideline is really just leaning in to leveraging technology. And this is where it's really critical to consider our goals in designing learning experiences. So for example, when we think about the ubiquity of assigning text um, as a way to, uh, to learn content, right? Um, we really want to think about what barriers this might present to students' comprehension. Um, we can minimize those through the use of text-to-speech, through voice recordings, um, and also ensure that students are able to access content in their primary language. Um, so providing access to tools like Google Translate, uh, multilingual glossaries, um, and not only providing them, but providing the scaffolding so that students are able to use them and so that we're able to use them. And then also thinking about how that opens up opportunities for us as educators to learn from our student from our students um, and share that among peers as well. All right, so if this is sort of new to you, um, and you know, we realize some of you may just be learning about guideline two or the guidelines themselves for the first time, you might be thinking, 
great. This sounds awesome. How in the world does anyone do all of that? That sounds super overwhelming. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, Brian and I have often faced the struggle ourselves. Uh, and when we work with faculty and pre-service teachers, that's one of the first things they say is, is how do I do this? Um, so one thing to keep in mind is just stressing that, you know, simply making research resources and supports digital actually goes a really long way in and of itself. It increases accessibility for every student. So you're not having to individualize just with those discrete accommodations. You're actually designing for, for accessibility proactively at the outset. And once you start doing it and building it into your design, you don't have to worry as much about like, did I hit this? Did I hit this and hit that? Because you've already thought about it. Um, it also empowers students with or without those accommodation letters, right? Because we know that not everybody, all students are going to access those in, in higher education, especially. Um, it allows them some, some time to play and to explore and to learn what's actually best for them. Um, for Brian and I, this has been super important because in teacher education, our students are learning not just the content that we give them, um, but they're also learning what we're teaching them, right? So we're very much modeling that and trying to practice what we teach. And we know that our students are going to be taking that away and using it in their further, further in their classroom. So the more we can make it usable for them and give them chances to explore, um, the likelier it's going to benefit their future students as well. Um, in terms of content, because that's another, you know, another concern folks have too is, okay, great, I can make everything accessible or digital. There's no way I can possibly curate this list of all of these resources. I'm, you know, I'm going to spend all my time doing that. It's, it's too much. Um, but this is where, again, we can really Think about how we want to include students in the design and um, build on their knowledge, their background knowledge, their resources, their communities, their cultures to assist us with resource curation um, and, and bring all of that to the table um, as valuable for their peers, valuable for us, um, and super instructive for future, future work that we may do as well. The next common concern um, that we hear a lot and that we in particular in, in our work in, in the graduate level um, is, is around this idea of rigor. Um, so doesn't providing all of these options just make things too easy? Um, and <laughs> it's it's often been top of mind in a higher ed context. Um, and this is where we feel like it's really, really crucial to disentangle the goals from the means. Um, because if we're not doing that, um, students don't get to choose how they're pursuing their goals. So if comprehension, for example, is a goal, it doesn't matter if students comprehend a phenomenon by reading about it, by watching something, by listening to something, by exploring it in some other way. We have to think about what's the goal that we're trying to get them to and empower them to choose their pathway. Um, so different pathways can get students where they need to go when we conflate those goals um, they're really deprived of meaningful opportunities to learn about themselves as learners as well. Um, in terms of the idea of rigor, <laughs> uh, this is something that we could probably spend a whole other hour or hours on, um, but it's something that's particularly, interest it, particularly interesting to us. Um, we currently have a chapter under review diving into this a little bit and just embedded notions of ableism and rigor um, in higher education, which are barriers that many of us potentially face. Um, so we do have some resources on that uh, in the digital handout as well. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brian now to guide us in interrogating the mindset behind this guidelines strategies. Excellent, thank you, Beth. So we are gonna be heading back to Mentimeter, uh, but first let me explain what's on the screen and it'll be there when we go to Mentimeter in a moment as well. Uh, we have an image of 14 brown eggs of wide varying size. And we're asking the question, I'd like you all to think about this a little bit, what might be some contributing factors to the large variation in egg size? So let me go ahead and swing us over to Mentimeter. And on your screen or device, it should have shifted to this. Um, and now there should be up to three spaces where you can add in uh, some ideas that you might have for what might be some contributing factors to why these different eggs are such different sizes. And we can see on the screen right now, the word cloud is starting to populate. Uh, the age of hen, chicken size, climate, nutrition is up there a couple of times, size of hen, time of year, nutrition again, yep. 
I am scanning to see diet, age, stress, type of chicken, breed, season, roosters, whether roosters are present, age. So some of the large ones that are starting to uh, come up more and more, we have ones around age, stress, size of the hen, nutrition, breed, diet. Those are some of the big ones that are starting to come up. And looking across some of the smaller uh, texts, a lot of those are highly related to those as well. So great. These are these are lots of ideas, all clearly uh, on track of understanding uh, the contributing factors to chicken egg size. So I'm going to provide a little bit of context here in validating that, yes, Everything I'm seeing up here are contributing factors to egg size. However, this photo is not a stock image. This picture was taken on my kitchen counter. These are eggs that came from my four hens. And these hens, we hand raised since they were one day old. They are all the same breed, the exact same age, given the same diet, and living in the same conditions. And we put the eggs, I'm gonna move us back over to here so we can see it, the picture larger. We put these eggs in this container so that the newer eggs go towards the back or as this picture is oriented towards the right-hand side so that we know that we're taking the older eggs first, which means variation in size happens each day. And it's inconsistent from the same hen from day to day and between hens on any given day. While I'm sure we could look up what the average egg size is for the breed and age of hens that I have, that average doesn't really tell us much. Variability is the norm. Variability is what we should expect in nature and throughout nature. So with that in mind, since this is not an agricultural webinar series, uh, we're going to shift over uh, to something more directly educationally related. But let's keep that in mind that variability is the norm. We are going to do a read aloud of Leo the Late Bloomer, a children's book that's been around for more than a half century and is used in numerous, countless classrooms to talk about variability. Leo the Late Bloomer by Robert Cross. Pictures by Jose Arego. Leo couldn't do anything right. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. He couldn't draw. He was a sloppy eater. And he never said a word. What's the matter with Leo? asked Leo's father. Nothing, said Leo's mother. Leo is just a late bloomer. Better late than never, thought Leo's father. Every day, Leo's father watched him for signs of blooming. And every night, Leo's father watched him for signs of blooming. Are you sure Leo's a bloomer? asked Leo's father. Patience, said Leo's mother. A watched bloomer doesn't bloom. So Leo's father watched television instead of Leo. The snows came. Leo's father wasn't watching, but Leo still wasn't blooming. The trees budded. Leo's father wasn't watching, but Leo still wasn't blooming. Then one day, in his own good time, Leo bloomed. He could read. He could write. He could draw. He ate neatly. He also spoke. And it wasn't just a word. It was a whole sentence. And that sentence was... I made it.
Okay. So now we're going to go back to Mentimeter. And our next slide is asking, in Leo the Late Bloomer, how is variability framed? And we have a sliding scale available to you right now. All the way to the left-hand side is unaccepting of variability. And all the way to the right-hand side is fully accepting of variability. So you can go ahead and slide on your screen. How do you feel like Leo the Late Bloomer frames the idea of variability? So you can see folks starting to put on there. I'll move my cursor over the screen so we can see. We have a few down towards the left-hand side, but increasingly more over towards the right-hand side. Variability within us of how we think about this book. We're up into our low 40s of having put up here. And right now we have a 3.5 uh, out of between one and five. Uh, 3.5 is our average right now. And you can see on the screen, we have at this moment, uh, two people giving it a one of uh, unaccepting a variability, five giving it a little bit better than that, 18 right in the middle. 15 towards the right-hand side, and nine all the way at the end, talking about it being fully accepting of variability. Let's keep this in the back of our mind right now. We're going to be returning to Leo again later. But for right now, we want to be able to talk a little bit more about what we mean by variability is the norm. It's something that Beth and I teach, uh, both pre-service teachers and other, educa other educators and leaders that we work with. And it's, a, and it's an idea that can be nodded along, right? Not all the eggs will be the same size. Not everyone will have done something at the same time. Variability is the norm. But there's the rest of that sentence. What do we mean by that? What are implications? We are going to offer to you right now a framework of several different, four different categories of how we have seen people who have started to understand the idea that variability is the norm, four different ways that they complete that idea. We've seen this across students and other educators that we've worked with. So first, variability is the norm, and some will always be outside of normal. As you can see here on this image to the right-hand side of the screen, we have a normal curve. All of us have been taught this in our statistics classes. And this is a common way, a common category of how people who are nodding along with yes, variability is the norm. Not all the eggs will be the same size. Not all the people will perform the same way. They go to statistics. It feels cold and calculating. It feels no nonsense. Yes, we know what the normal curve is. Most people will fall within that. That's normal. However, what we've definitely found is it doesn't tend to be value neutral. There tends to be emotional balances that come along with this idea. And that, that veneer of cold and calculated nonsense statistics, as you can see on the images now, with the sad face to the left-hand side of the curve and the happy, amazed face towards the right-hand side of the curve, there tends to actually be emotions in how we think and feel about normal curve and this idea. So that's our first category. Our second category is that the idea that, yes, variability is the norm, and we should be nicer to people who aren't normal. Now, this comes from a good place. And don't get us wrong. Being nice, definitely better than not being nice. But as you can see in the image here, what this does is draws a circle of normality. And normal falls within that circle. And then we have the hands the making a symbol of a heart. We should be nice to those outside of the circle. And we are pro-nice. But what this tends to mask is that many of those same emotions about those who are in versus outside of the circle of normal are still there. The very idea that we need to advocate for niceness to those outside of the circle of normal shows that this isn't people that we view as being the same or on equal footing. This idea of who's outside of the circle is still an outside of the circle. 
So that's our second category. Our third category is yes, variability is the norm, and we should expand our definition of normal to include more people. So we should make that circle of normal larger. And you can see in this image here to the right-hand side of the screen, we have that original smaller circle of normal. And with the dotted arrows, it expands out to a larger circle. We want more people inside the circle, fewer people outside of the circle, which once again masks the reality that this conceptualization and this framing of variability still finds being inside the circle of normal desirable and outside undesirable. Now, granted, those who hold this mindset wish to include more people in the desirable, and that is certainly nicer than wanting to keep them out of the circle of desirable, but it's not actually fully aligned with an equitable and inclusive mindset. So our fourth category, which is what we certainly advocate for, is variability is the norm, and we should reject the very concept of normal. And as you can see in the image here, is that normal with a circle crossed out. Because the very concept of norm is scientifically invalid. It is manipulating a mathematical abstraction as a way to mask this forced normalcy, who gets to decide where the circle of normal is drawn, who doesn't have the power to influence that and then finds themselves outside of it, it is also inherently oppressive. So if we think about these four categories, all of which can nod their head at the idea that variability is the norm, we have said, now this is not to suggest People need to move through each of these four categories. It's also not really to suggest that there aren't blurred lines between them and even fifth or sixth categories that may exist. But we've put them up here purposefully, moving from left to right. The, the left-hand category is that normal curve. And while, again, um, it is not literally the same as insisting that all eggs are the same size, but it's not that far away from it. In the middle of this chart that we have here is the be kind to people outside of the circle of normal, as well as let's expand the circle of normal. Both of those, niceness and including more people, are nice ideas. And they are potentially more equitable and more inclusive than just that statistical mindset of the normal curve. But we very purposely put all the way to the right-hand side, rejection of normal, which is the most equitable and inclusive mindset when talking about variability. For a lot more on this, and you can see in the digital handout, we have links. Uh, Jonathan Mooney has a fantastic book, Normal Sucks, uh, that goes into a lot more depth, uh, in particularly about normal being scientifically invalid and inherently oppressive. Uh, Beth and I both teach it uh, lots of times uh, to students and have great conversations. We recommend it widely to folks. So with these four categories of how we can frame variability, let's now look at another children's book. I'm going to be sharing with you a read aloud of Ernest the Moose Who Doesn't Fit. Hi, I'm Sarah, the children's librarian at the Deer Park Branch Library, and today I'm going to read Ernest, the Moose Who Doesn't Fit by Katherine Rayner. Ernest, the Moose Who Doesn't Fit. He looks like an awfully big moose, doesn't he? Ernest is a rather large moose. He is so large that he can't fit inside this book. Luckily, Ernest is also a very determined moose. He is not going to give up easily. He struggles to shimmy, shift, and shuffle in forward. Did that work? Not yet. He tries to squidge, squadge, and squeeze in backward. Hmm, I don't think that's working either. Ernest's middle fits in easily. But what about the rest of him? 
What about his legs and his antlers? Ernest is very disappointed. This book is just too small for him. Or is it? Ernest's little friend has a big idea. She fetches some masking tape. And Ernest collects some paper. What do you think they're going to do? Together, they carefully crinkle, crumple, and stick. They are busy for a very long time. Finally, they are finished. Ernest may be a rather large moose, but now he has a rather large book. And he fits in perfectly. So now we're going to go back to Mentimeter again. And we're going to ask the same question that we asked about Leo the Late Bloomer. But now we've given you a framework for how to think about the framing of variability. And so on this scale, all the way to the left is insisting on normal. And all the way to the right is rejecting the concept of normal. And on your screen, when you're sliding your scale, you will see that in between are some of those other categories of viewing the normal curve, being nice, expanding normal. So we're asking now, in earnest, the moose who doesn't fit, how is variability framed? Uh, and we can see folks already responding on here. And there's a lot towards the right here. So if I cursor over, uh, we have... 16 people at this moment uh, are saying 17, 18, all the way to the right, rejecting the concept of normal, with another 16, 17 now uh, that are saying just before that, that it is, see, that is expanding the concept of normal, with an average of four and a half, uh, right in between. We have one uh, saying that we actually think this is about being nicer uh, to people who are outside of normal. Great. So I'll wait another moment in case anyone else wants to put in. So the reason why we ask you this is we now are going to return back to Leo the Late Bloomer. Now that you've seen an example of a different children's book, and now that we've offered you a framework on these mindsets, we ask you to, reflecting back on Leo the Late Bloomer, how is variability framed? And if you see now, we have the same scale, but we've given you the same framework that we gave you for, um, for Ernest the Moose that doesn't fit. So if folks can go ahead and put on there, once again, all the way to the left is it actually insisting on normal. All the way to the right is rejecting the concept of normal. Uh, and then in between are some of those other categories. So if we look here on the screen, uh, we have four people saying that Leo the Late Bloomer, uh, reflecting back on it, five people now are saying Leo the Late Bloomer actually insists on normal. 14 people saying that it really falls in that statistical normal curve. Five people saying that it's about being nicer to people who aren't normal. One person saying that Leo is about expanding normal, and three people still saying, no, it is about rejecting the concept of normal. Great. I'm going to give a few more moments to give more people a chance to be able to do this. We've had some more come in, particularly down here on the left-hand side and towards the middle. I'm at the same time glancing over at the chat, uh, trying to make sure I don't distract myself with that. I know Beth and others are monitoring, so I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but I'm very interested to hear what people have to say as well. So I'm going to move between a few of these to explain that our reason for asking you to come back to Leo and reevaluate Leo Sure, part of it is to compare 
what you see on the screen right now of Leo the Late Bloomer. Uh, that book's framing of variability is on average, people are saying about a 2.5. We can compare that to Ernest the Moose Who Doesn't Fit, which on average folks saw as a 4.5. And that's an important comparison between these two practices, right? These two books. But the other thing we wanted to point out is how interrogating mindsets can change how we view a practice. So if we go back to our original view and rating of Leo was on average a 3.5. Whereas now, having seen a different example and been given a framework to be able to really interrogate mindsets of variability, it's now at a 2.5. And how that shift, the book didn't change, right? So we wanted to be able to share with you how that kind of thinking deeply and critically about mindset can help us reevaluate practices. Okay, and before we jump into practices, um, Brian, I just wanted, did want to elevate, there was a question in the chat um, when you cater to those who don't fall in the normal range, you change strategies, standards, extent of content covered, speed at which content is covered, and the majority of um, quote unquote normal people are disadvantaged. How do we answer this comment? Um, so I just wanted to take, since that's not a clarifying question, that's a more in-depth question. I just wanted to take a moment and give some space for that. I do want to point out that several folks um, in the community here with us have popped in ideas um, in response to this. Um, Brian, do I have some thoughts, but do you want to go ahead? No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think I, uh, you know, Tom had a great thought. I think that's that's really where we get into this idea of disentangling goals from means, right? And we're going to talk a little bit, you know, just briefly on it because I realize we're running out of time. Um, but when your goal is consistent, you're actually not catering to any specific student. You're building that flexibility into the design so that students have autonomy and, and decision-making over the means of how they meet the goal. Um, but the goal doesn't change. The goal remains the same. It's still a rigorous goal that fits in with your content. Um, it's supporting students to choose the best way for them to meet the goal and recognizing that that could change on any given day. If they're having a bad day, if they're struggling with the content in particular, um, something else is happening, you know, there's this class moved to Zoom that day, you know, anything. Um, so it's really designing for anticipating and expecting that variability um, and then designing flexibly to allow for that. Um, so but I didn't. I, we had such great comments on that in the chat as well. Um, and I would invite others to keep um, keep contributing. Um, appreciate your your all involvement in that. Um, I'm gonna shift now to part three, which is the applications part. So we had lots of great ideas about what this uh, rejecting of normal and this mindset behind guideline two looks like in practice within the chat. Stephanie also gave us some guidance on how to save the chat, which I did not know. So thank you for sharing, Stephanie, that's awesome. Um, glad, glad I know that now. Um, so Brian and I have this habit of uh, when we write together or work together, we love to talk about our mistakes. So we're just going to keep doing that now um, because we make a lot of them, but we learn a lot from them. Um, so this slide shows a picture of a classroom with desks in rows facing toward a um, what looks like a movie screen. So one common mistake, um, I, I talk, we're going to talk about applications through the lens of common missteps and our solutions to those missteps. So one common misstep that we have certainly made um, is the idea of um, not rejecting the one size fits all mindset, right? Um, so this idea would be taking one sort of non-traditional modality, maybe watching a movie and offering it to everyone. So saying, okay, this week in my, you know, freshman English course, we're, we're going to watch a movie um, instead of reading a text. Um, and while this might be super helpful to students who experience text as a barrier, um, it's actually creating a barrier for many other students. And it's really limiting access to the content um, and engagement to the content for some as well. Um, another example that we've um, seen, seen folks use is uh, offering different modalities on different days. So if you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, course, right? Um, 
Monday, we're going to uh, read about the events leading up to World War I. Wednesday, we're going to watch a movie about some of the initial conflicts. And then Friday, we're going to listen to an audio narrative about key moments in the war. Um, so again, so now you're you're offering multiple modalities, right? So it's, it's a little bit expanded, but it's still that one-size-fits-all mindset um, where we're insisting on a certain type of means for everyone to meet a particular goal. And that goal is kind of a moving target, right? So if I'm, you know, someone who does not process things well, you know, by by watching a movie, um, I'm going to be missing one day of content and, and I'm going to suffer. Um, and so, you know, these, these shifts don't really challenge that idea of normativity. So what's the solution? Um, let students decide. <laughs> um, you know, they they're they probably know themselves reasonably well, but we can support them to know themselves even better as learners. Um, so the more that we can offer, scaffold, and model the use of different options, the more students are going to learn more about themselves and understand what works for them. Um, and again, realize that it's not static; um, it's going to change. And again, for us as teacher educators, super important to be modeling that because our students are taking our pedagogy and using that to inform their future pedagogy in their classrooms as well. So it's kind of that ongoing cycle. Um, you know, many of you, even if you're not working in pre-service teacher education, you know, you likely have students who might go on to become teachers or to be educators in some way, whether that's in a hospital um, or in some other, you know, setting where they're, you know, training new learners themselves. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, Brian. Thanks. Another common misstep is uh, how we present options. And Diana and I were having a chat uh, in uh, in the chat <laughs> about one way to, to think about this. But sometimes we present multiple options. We kind of make it look like one's better than the other, right? Even if it's inadvertent, it's still devaluing other options as valid and viable. Um, and it's likely going to deter some learners. So, for example, if I assign an, a journal article and I say, well, if you're having trouble understanding that, you can watch the video. Um, or if, you know, it's the words are too big, then you can listen to the audio. Um, both of these are conflating the goals with the means. Um, if the goal is comprehending something that's in that article, I don't want reading the text to be a barrier, whether it's meaning making or decoding, that's that's the challenge. Um, I want them to understand, so I'm going to give them the resources to be able to do that. And again, this also doesn't challenge that notion of normativity, because I'm preventing one option as preferable, as normal, um, as the best way. And, and students are going to pick up on that. They're going to internalize that. Um, and chances are they're either going to get, engage in some really unproductive struggle trying to do what they think I, as the instructor in a position of power, want them to do, um, or they're going to give up. Um, and neither of those outcomes are things that we want. So the solution here, um, offer equally valid options, but in different formats. So there's an image here of that first Mentimeter uh, visual that we had, where it was the person with the question mark, the person crawling, and the person with the trophy to kind of gauge our background knowledge of guideline two. Um, that's what we tried to do with that warm up exercise, with that pre assessment. We basically asked you the same question in different ways. Um, none of them was better than the other. Uh, maybe you preferred one way and that was fine. Maybe if we did this tomorrow, you'd prefer a different way and that would be fine too. All of us met our goals and got us the information that we needed to assess where this group's background knowledge is with respect to guideline two of UDL. So we need to do the same thing with the resources that we're offering in our courses. So we are going to, uh, with only a few minutes left, we're going to go back to Mentimeter one last time. And now what we're asking for folks is, what is one takeaway you are hoping to use from today? And while this is populating, uh, we, we will occasionally reference some of the things coming up. We also wanted to open it up as well uh, for more questions uh, for folks. So in these last few minutes, as we're seeing, hopefully going to see on the screen, uh, takeaways that people are hoping to take from today, uh, we can answer other questions as well, either from chat uh, or, uh, I don't know, others monitoring chat. Beth, if there were other things that came up, I, I did want to say, as is starting to populate, I think that that question that you brought up 
that was brought up before about who are you disadvantaging, right? That if you change those strategies, aren't you now disadvantaging those who fall within normal? Um, I, I do want to point out that first misstep in the strategies that you gave, I think speaks very directly to that. I will also mention um, something from a conversation I've had uh, with other teacher educators is that um, if you believe that no matter what I do, I'm going to be disadvantaging someone, which again, I, I really do think that the strategies that Beth just gave about just give options and empower students to choose their options, um, that largely sidesteps that. But to whatever degree it is true that no matter what you do, you're going to disadvantage someone, um, I would encourage you to at least think, but am I going to continue to disadvantage students that I know systematically are already disadvantaged um, because of how the system is set up and who and what it privileges? Um, and so that question of, or should I create a situation where those who have had to, um, those who have traditionally been burdened uh, by that, am I going to create a scenario that maybe does give them the leg up that others have been advantaged by all along? So we can see here on the screen, lots of stuff up here, offer equally valid options, reject normal. We, we are sorry that the 25 character limit uh, does make it hard to write something uh, more intensive about here. Embrace variability, avoid hierarchy, reject normativity, norm, normal is not scientific, um, normal is a myth, all of those great things. Beth, were there other things that you've seen come up in chat or other last comments you wanted to make sure we leave with? Uh, great, great conversation in the chat. Thank you all for your engagement, both in the chat and in the Menthe. Um, I just have to give it more to, more to the person who wrote, provide actual options. Um, that was a really that was a really big learning curve for us um, was sort of, you know, it, it's another misstep, right? You know, sort of giving non-options just to say that you're giving options, but not meaningfully scaffolding those. So I um, appreciate you elevating that. Um, it's, you know, this is an ongoing journey for us as well and um, learned a lot from all of you today. Um, and yes, Brian's chickens are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I will mention uh, one other resource we'll be able to give is Mentimeter allows us to we'll be able to download a PDF of each one of the um, each one of the screens. So we'll be able to include that with the other resources if folks afterwards want to go back and see these word clouds and see these ratings. So thank you both on um, the comments in the chat are amazing. This The conversation was incredibly uh, active. So that was great with people asking all kinds of questions. And really, I think what is most important to me is the peer-to-peer -peer support with, oh, by the way, you can't download the chat if you're not a host and all that good stuff. And that's really what makes these uh, webinars so successful when you bring together a group of people who are genuinely interested in how we support each other and create learning experiences that are meaningful and relevant um, to everybody who's participating. So I thank you so much for your time and contributions. And in case people don't know who, are, who have not yet left, um, there's a great volume of new directions uh, for teaching and learning that uh, Beth and Brian have uh, contributed to. And um, if you haven't looked at that, it's a one, as she says, as one of the editors of that volume. But it really is, it has all the individuals who are participating in these webinars uh, as presenters. It has all their um, chapters. They all wrote a chapter. So we're really excited about that. So again, I want to thank everybody. And um, we will be getting this up on the Padlet and on YouTube for people to see. So thank you for your time. And um, good luck in your UDL journey, everybody. And Rob put the uh, link to the volume in the chat. So um, please grab that on your way out. So thank you so much, Beth and Brian. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Thank Diana. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye.